Hi, today we're going to cover sampling distributions, and this corresponds to section 3.1 in the Lock 5 textbook. And this chapter represents a radical tra change and transition from our previous two chapters. And I would say that this is when the material in the course starts to become a little bit more difficult. And so what we're really going to be doing from here on out is understanding and applying inference. So what have we learned and what will we learn? Well, so far we've learned how to obtain a sample from a population, and we've also learned how to design a study. And those are things that we learned in chapter one. We've learned how to describe a sample numerically and visually, right? We've talked about various things like means and proportions, differences in means and differences in proportions, correlations, standard deviations, five number summaries, all of that stuff. And we've talked about how you visualize this data, bar charts, scatter plots, uh, histograms, and so on. And this material was covered in chapter two. But now what we want to really do is we want to talk about how are we going to use our sample to actually make inferences and to learn about our population. And that's what this chapter is all about. It introduces this idea. These next two chapters are really the ones that are going to solidify that notion of how we go about this in statistics. So there's a few key concepts in this uh, slide here for today's lecture that you've actually already been exposed to. You've already learned a little bit about what a parameter is and what a statistic is. I've told you that the statistic represents our best estimate for a parameter, and it's also a point estimate for a parameter. We're going to contrast this with something we're going to learn on Thursday, which is called a confidence interval, which is not a point estimate, but an interval estimate. The most important idea, though, presented in this chapter is the notion of a sampling distribution. And I think a sampling distribution is a pretty tough concept. I think it's really hard. When I was a student and I was learning about sampling distributions, it was very difficult. There's a lot of, um, a lot of things that are going on in a sampling distribution, and I think it was just pretty difficult to understand. So my hope is that through the activity that we're working on, um, which involves simulation, you're, you'll actually be able to understand the idea of a sampling distribution. So we do statistics so that we can make inferences, right? The whole point of doing statistics, collecting a sample, is so that we can talk about the population. And this is referred to as statistical inference. So we go out there, we collect a subsample of our population, right? We collect that data, we calculate something on our sample, and then we use that thing that we've calculated to make an inference about our population. That's really what the whole process is here. So we've collected just a piece of that sample, I mean a piece of that population, and we're going to measure something on it, we're going to calculate something, and then we're going to say that this is our estimate for something in our population. So this slide should probably not be uh, too new to you. This is a bit of a review. Um, we've talked about the fact that we use our samples to calculate things called statistics. And that statistics estimate things in our population, which are called parameters. And a statistic is just a number. A parameter is just a number. So we've talked about a sample mean is just, you know, the average of something you calculate on your sample. So maybe it could be the average height, or it could be... Um, the average um, miles that you live from St. Mike's, things like that. Uh, and these are estimates for our population parameter, the height of students at St. Mike's, the, uh, the average height of students at St. Mike's, the average distance that all St. Mike's students live from um, St. Mike's. <clears throat> now, if we have just a single sample, which in most cases we do, our statistic represents our best estimate of a parameter. And you're going to see throughout the semester, I'm going to refer to what is our best estimate. And all I'm referring to is, hey, what is our statistic? This is just another way for me to refer to it. Um, it's also considered a point estimate because it's just a single value. We just have that single value that is an estimate of our population parameter. This will be in contrast, as I said earlier, to what we're going to be learning uh, in chapter in this chapter in the next section, which is going to be on confidence intervals. Parameters are considered fixed. They cannot change, whereas statistics vary. This is an important idea. So I would encourage you to spend some time trying to differentiate in your mind the difference between a parameter and a statistic. I would also encourage you to create uh, flashcards in this material, because I think a lot of this 
stuff in statistics is actually flashcard worthy. So I would encourage you to do that. So what are examples of the parameters and statistics we've learned so far? So this table right here summarizes essentially chapter two. And this is something that you've already seen. I've shown you an example of this last class. Um, I'll go through it very quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in our column on the left, it says the type of a variable. Is it a categorical variable that you have? Do you have two categorical variables? Do you have a quantitative variable? Do you have a categorical and a quantitative variable? Or do you have two quantitative variables? And then I'm just putting into words what it is that we are actually calculating. So if we have a single categorical variable, it's a proportion. If we have two categorical variables, it's a difference in proportions. If we have a quantitative variable, it's a mean. And if we have a categorical and a quantitative variable, it's a difference in means. And then if we have two quantitative variables, it's a correlation. Now, these things in the population, these population parameters, which I will probably just refer to as parameter because it's always going to be a population parameter. There's no such thing as a sample parameter. Um, a proportion we represent with this italicized P. And, the, and when we have a single categorical variable, that's what we're interested in. When we have two, we're looking at that difference, P1 minus P2. Um, if we've got a mean, we represent it with mu. If we have a, a, a difference in means from a categorical and a quantitative variable, it's mu1 minus mu2. And then if we have two quantitative variables, it's this row, which is kind of looks like a P. So try not to get it too confused. Uh, I will probably do my best when I'm creating questions to not make it ambiguous so that you don't inadvertently put in a P instead of a row. Now we have these sample statistics, which are estimates of our population parameters. So we have P hat for proportion, P hat one minus P hat two for P one minus P two, X bar for mu, X bar one minus X bar two for mu one and mu two. And then we have R as an estimate of row. Now we visualize a categorical variable in this class with a bar chart. Uh, if we have two categoricals, we use a segmented or a side-by-side -side bar chart. If we have a quantitative variable, we could use a histogram, a dot plot, or a box plot. If you have a categorical and a quantitative, you can use a side-by-side -side histogram, dot plot, or box plot. If you have two quantitative variables, you can use a scatter plot. So this is pretty much what we've covered so far. This, was, this is basically just chapter two. So let's quickly apply this for a couple uh, examples. And hopefully you find that these examples are easy. If you find that they're hard, I would encourage you to reach out to me or to reach out to the attached tutor. So this is an example on Olympic marathon data. And I'll, I'll read it and then we will go through the questions. There were 85 men who finished the 2012 Olympic marathon. The average time to finish the marathon was 140.6 minutes or just over two hours and 20 minutes, which is incredibly fast. I'm not sure if any of you have ever run a marathon, but that's incredibly fast. Suppose we took a random sample of just 20 of these people. So let's not take all 85. Let's just take a random sample of 20. And we calculated the mean to be 141.6 minutes. Our first question, what is the population parameter? So when we're reading back through this thing, we want to think to ourselves, okay, what have we learned? We've learned proportions. We've learned means. We've learned differences in proportions, differences in means, and we've learned a correlation. So if I skim through this little blurb up here, we see that the word is average. We see this word average. Now, because we see the word average, um, we know, as well as the word mean later on, that we know we're dealing with a mean. So what is the population parameter for mean? Well, it's represented as mu. And what is that in words? That's going to be the average uh, marathon finishing time for all men in 2020 and that mu is going to equal 140.6 what is the sample statistic and what is it an estimate of Okay, so again, we, we're still dealing with a mu. So our sample statistic will be X bar, which is the sample mean. So it's the average marathon finishing time for these 20 runners. And that was calculated to be 141.16 minutes. 
and x bar is an estimate of mu, right? So x bar is an estimate of mu. And if we look here, we see that x bar and mu are actually pretty close. And part of that has to do with the fact that we took a random sample. I shouldn't even say part of it. A big component of that has to do with a random sample. It cannot be understated how important random samples are. Now, if we took another sample of a sample size of 20, should we expect to get 141.6 minutes? In other words, would we expect that we would get that same sample mean? Well, what if I took 20 different runners out of those 85? If I took 20 different runners and calculated their average speed, it's entirely possible that their average speed would be, uh, their average time it took to finish the marathon would be different. Or if I took a random sample of the 85 again, but this time I had maybe just 10 of those people, but 10 different people, I'm going to end up with a different sample mean, a different X bar. So in fact, the only way I'm probably going to end up with the same time, unless there were men that had uh, finishing times that were exactly the same, would be if I got those same 20 men over and over and over again. So if we took another one, should we expect to get 141.6? The answer is no. We'll do one more example. It's, it's pretty similar to the one we just did. In March 2015, a Nielsen Global Online Survey found that consumers are increasingly willing to pay more for socially responsible products. Over 30,000 people in 60 countries were polled about their purchasing habits, and 66% of those residents said they were willing to pay more for products and services from companies who are committed to positive social and environmental impact. We are interested in estimating the proportion of all consumers willing to pay more. So the first thing it says is give notation for the quantity we are estimating. So go back in your mind and think, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to estimate a mean? Are we trying to estimate a proportion, a difference in mean, a difference in proportion, or a correlation? At this point in the semester, those are the only five things we're doing. Now, I know we've learned about other statistics, like a median and a standard deviation, but the only statistics we're ever going to do inference on in this class is going to be on the ones in that table from a few slides ago. So, let's give notation for the quantity we are interested in estimating. Well, what is that quantity? It says right here, the proportion of all consumers willing to pay more. So that's going to be P. That's not rho, just to make that clear, that's a P. So this is going to be a proportion. And it says no, notation for the quantity we are using to make the estimate. Well, that's going to be P hat, right? P hat is an estimate of P. What is the value of the estimate? Okay, well, if we go over here, we see that it says 66% of the respondents said they were willing to pay more for products and services. So P hat is going to be that percent, but represented as a proportion. So remember, a proportion is between 0 and 1, and a percent is not. A percent is between 0 and 100. I know that in sort of everyday speech, we refer to a percent as a proportion, but it's not. So we need to convert that to a, uh, to a proportion. And that's easy enough. What we do is we just drop the percent. So we take 66%, we drop the percent, and then we divide by 100. We get 0.66. P hat equals 0.66. And that is our value of the best estimate. That's the best estimate is what we have there. Okay. Hopefully this, this example was also easy. Uh, I'll show you, uh, I'll have you do a homework problem that will be pretty similar to this. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna change gears a little bit. So hopefully you've, 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 you, um, you've noted from that first example that our sample means can in fact change. And as, I, as I've shown you before, or told you, I shouldn't say shown you, I've told you that our sample statistics change. So we're going to look at this in a little more detail here. So our, what we're going to do is we're going to look at commute time in New York City. So a large financial institution in New York City employs about 5,000 people, and they're working at a Wall, Street, uh, a Wall Street location. Real estate is very expensive in this neighborhood, so some employees live a considerable distance away from the office. 
The HR department surveyed employees, asking them how long it took them to commute to work that morning. So, let's say that the HR took a random sample of 20 individuals. And they did that right here. That's this plot up here in the top. So there's 5,000 people. Instead of surveying all 5,000, they just decided to survey 20 people. And each dot here corresponds to the commute time for an individual who works at this office. So we can see if we look down sort of at that x-axis there, that there's some values around 20. There's this, this spike, uh, spike right above 25 and then there's some values that are sort of trailing off to the to the left now that's our first sample so we took one sample okay and if we look down at the mean we see that the mean for that one was 46.15 minutes now let's say that instead of that sample they took sample two well this is what that data looks like you can see that there are individuals in this data set that were not in the other one Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate their average. And we see that that average is 40.85. So all of these are X bars, right, so far. And then we're going to do it again. We're going to take one more sample of size 20. And our data looks like this. And we calculate a sample average of 52.25. And then we take an average. Uh, and then we do one more sample of size 20. And it looks like this one in the lower right. And then we calculate our average is 47.5. So we see in our four samples that we took, we have some variability. In fact, we have 12 minutes, which is actually quite a lot when the lowest value is 12, uh, 40. Because that you're saying in that situation that it could take 25% longer to get to work um, if that 52 is, say, closer to the true amount of time it takes to get to work on average. So all of these X bars are going to be estimates of mu, right? So they're all estimates of the same parameter. And I should have given these X bars subscripts because in fact, they are sample means from our four different samples. But the mu doesn't get a subscript because the mu is only mu, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these four means and we're gonna just plot them. And this is what they look like here. So here's our distribution of those four means from before. And what we probably want to do is we probably want to use the sample average as our estimate of mu. So maybe the sample estimate is like here. I mean, not this. I don't mean sample. I mean, we want to use the, the mean of this distribution of our four sample means as our estimate of mu. So maybe we would use this, oops, sorry, this value right here as our estimate for mu. So this would be our estimate of mu. But what if instead of taking 20, uh, just four different samples, what if we took 2,000 samples and all of the same size of a sample size 20, and then we took that average? Well, if we do that, this distribution would look like this. So it's a little hard to see here, but each of these... Um, in this plot here are corresponding to little circles. So these are all circles. So this is still a dot plot. And each individual dot, just like here before, is gonna to correspond to a sample mean of, from a sample whose sample size is 20, okay? So if we take the average of this distribution right here, right here and we see that the average is 45.36, and we see that the true um, commute, the, the true average commute time, mu, equals 45.43. So in fact, that value is really close. Uh, so the, the average of this, of all of those, is really close. And this is what's referred to as a sampling distribution. And so this center is what we would use as our estimate for mu. Now, if you look at this closely, you'll probably notice that it looks fairly bell-shaped. And that's not a surprise. The shape of these is usually bell-shaped. In particular, in this class, we're going to be working with things like this, which are called sampling distributions, that are going to be very well-behaved, and they're going to look bell-shaped. And they're going to be centered 
at the, the population parameter. In this case, we're, we're interested in the sample mean, so our population parameter is mu. So if we look down here, and you, this won't happen in the notes online, but you'll see I say that the standard deviation is 6.57. That's what the standard deviation is. That's what got cut off down here. Um, this is going to be what we're going to call the standard error. So the standard error is just a fancy word for the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. Um, but that's all it is. It's just like we have this sampling distribution. Um, and the standard deviation of that is going to be called a standard error. So let's stop for one quick second to just kind of catch ourselves and try to recap. So what is contained in a sampling? Oops, I didn't mean to jump there. Uh, what is contained in a sampling distribution? A sampling distribution will contain your sample statistic for a given sample size for all of the possible samples in a population. Here, this is just kind of an estimate of our sampling distribution, and I've estimated it through something called simulation, which you will be doing in class. Now, one thing you may be wondering about with a sampling distribution is, does a sampling distribution look like the distribution of the population? So the population is going to be the commute time of everybody at this work. So let's take a look here. So this is a slide of the distribution of all 5,000 commuters and how long it takes them to get to work. How would you describe the shape of this? I hope that you're looking at this and you would describe this as a right skewed, because to me, this is clearly right skewed. This is not symmetric, it's right skewed. Some individuals, it takes nearly three hours to get to work. So you'll notice this is our population. And if I were to take the average of this, that's called mu. And so when I'm referring to mu back here, that's 45.43, that means that the average of this is 45.43. And we'll notice that this is right skewed, but that this is bell shaped, which means that the sampling distribution doesn't have to be shaped like the population. And that's a really important thing to note. And it makes sense because if you stop and think about it for a second, the population contains data on each individual driving time it takes to get to work. The sampling distribution instead has information on sample averages. So they're two totally different things. One, is a sample, one contains sample statistics. One contains times it takes people to drive to work. So there's no real reason why they should look alike. Now, if these ideas are difficult for you to understand, basically what we're going to be doing the rest of the semester is unpacking sampling distributions. And we're going to be unpacking them visually in the next couple of days. So let's recap everything that I've said. What is a sampling distribution and what is a standard error? The distribution, uh, no, so sorry, sampling distribution. The distribution of sample statistics computed for different samples of the same size. The same population. So it's important to know in the sampling distribution that it's sample statistics computed for different samples of the same size from the same population. Okay. Remember the population in the example I just showed you contained information on commute time. It didn't contain sample statistics. A sampling distribution shows us or tells us how much the sample statistic varies from sample to sample. So if we go back two slides, we'll see that the sample, the sample mean can vary quite a bit when the sample size is 20, right? It goes from the sample mean being just a little bit above 20 to 70. So depending on any of the samples that we took, we could have had a commute time whose average was about 20 or whose average was about 70. And the sampling distribution gives us that sense of variability. And we're going to measure that variability using the standard error below. For, for this class, our sampling distributions are going to be generally bell-shaped. And they're generally going to be centered at the population parameter. Now, this isn't always going to be the case, but in general, this is going to be the case. We're going to work on some stuff in class that this may not be the case. But for... Um, but for your homework and, and things like that, and for quizzes, that will probably be the case. 
It's just when we're looking at activities which are intended to sort of make us dig a little bit deeper and understand things, they're going to maybe not necessarily be bell-shaped and centered at the population parameter. But we'll talk about that when we work on an activity. So as I just showed you too, it doesn't need to look like the population. So this is what the population looks like. Wow, it's right skewed. This is, this is an approximation of the sampling distribution. It looks bell-shaped. Those do not have the same shape. And the most important thing to making sure that the, that the sampling distribution works is to ensure that we get random samples. Random samples are critical to prevent bias. Bias basically is what prevents us from getting a good estimate of our population parameter. Now, something that we're going to talk about that we're going to be going over throughout this semester now, and that's something I would strongly encourage you at this particular moment to flashcard, is a, what is a sample, what is a population, and what is a sampling distribution? If you can understand these three ideas, you're golden for this semester. If you can keep these three concepts separate in your mind, you are going to be totally set up. So a sample is what we actually have data on. The population is what we're actually interested in, which is every, everything that uh, all of the cases. Our sampling distribution is our sample statistic. It's our, it's our distribution of the sampling statistics for a given sample size. So I would strongly encourage you to flashcard these. So I'm going to just quickly erase that because as you can see that this slide doesn't really have anything to do with that. This slide is, a, is about what is the effect of the sample size on our sampling distribution. We're going to be doing an activity in class where you're going to actually visually see this. Um, and if you've read your textbook, you've also gotten a sense of this. But as the sample size increases, our standard error decreases which makes sense because as our sample size gets bigger, we'd expect to have less variability in our different estimates for our sample mean. As our sample size increases, the mean of the sampling distribution gets closer to the population parameter. So our, our mean of that sampling distribution will get closer to the population parameter. As our sample size increases, the sampling distribution will look more bell-shaped and symmetric. So if we have a very small sample size and we have a very strongly skewed population, that it is possible that our sampling distribution does not look symmetric and bell-shaped. However, as our sample size increases, that sampling distribution will look bell-shaped and symmetric regardless of what the shape of our population is for the statistics we're going to investigate in this class. So I hope this makes sense to you. I hope you spend some time really digging into these concepts and thinking about them. These are really challenging ideas. The idea of a sampling distribution is the toughest thing we've encountered so far this semester. So if you don't understand, please come to class with questions and please feel free to send me an email.